dots. There are lots of difficulties in understanding the soda space. I haven't listed all of them. Uh, some of the relevant ones for what I'm going to talk about here is this Gibbons Hawking entropy does not have very much microscopic support. In the case of black holes, originally starting with Strominger Waffa, and we've gone a long way since then, uh, there's been ways to understand uh, how that um, area of a 4G Newton entropy can be understood in terms of microscopic configurations of brains and strings and things, at least at weak coupling. And, you know, there's been work in this direction in the context of cosmological horizons, but I think it's fair to say there's no universally agreed upon uh, construction that accounts for the Gibbons Hawking entropy. Another point, which is related, is that the zero point entropy is difficult to interpret. You know, what is uh, getting this entropy as area over 4G Newton? Uh, the easiest way to do that is to use Euclidean techniques. And what Euclidean techniques do for you, which is, um, uh, the most interesting thing is they fix the zero point entropy. The fact that entropy scales like area is not surprising. You can get that from the you know, first law of thermodynamics. Uh, you throw in a little particle past the horizon, track how the temperature changes and do that kind of experiment. And that'll give you the differentials of how the entropy changes. But fixing this, it does not fix free the zero point entropy, which even in the black hole case is an important thing. In the black hole case, it's sort of natural to say, well, when the black hole shrinks and disappears, we should just fix that to be S equals zero. So you didn't really need the Euclidean techniques to tell you that. It's not that surprising that that should have S equals zero. In the cosmological horizon case, it's more confusing as the horizon shrinks and goes to zero, kind of is, you know cramping you inside it because it's out there. So it's, it's sort of weird to say that one should be fixed to zero. It's, it's a little more confusing. Um, another thing is that the you know, black hole horizon encodes the interior of the black hole. And you can ask which side does the cosmological horizon encode? And we're going to yeah, talk about that in this talk. Uh, another important difference is that the cosmological horizon is both more universal and more observer dependent than the black hole horizon. What do I mean by that? It's more universal in the sense that the theory itself, once you put a positive cosmological constant, is just it's going to have horizons. Black holes are particular solutions in a theory which bring up horizons, but that theory doesn't have to have a horizon associated to it. In this sense, it's more universal. You're just going to ask them to, to consider, and you're going to have these horizons. Different observers will have different ones, but they'll be there. And observer dependence is, is what I just said. The different observers will have different horizons. That's to you know to some extent true in the black hole case as well. One somebody who jumps into the black hole has a different horizon than someone who stays outside. So you know there is some observer dependence in the black hole case as well. It's just much stronger in the cosmological case. The last point I want to make is in these you know, page curve um, computations, it's sort of important to have some asymptotic region where you have a ton of space. You can collect radiation and do experiments on it without back reacting and, and messing everything up. Um, and if you're in asymptotic flat space, you definitely have that. Uh, in DeSitter space, you definitely don't have that. Your cosmological horizon gives you a sort of a finite patch of space to do experiments. If you try and start collecting radiation from the horizon and doing an experiment, you can easily back react on the system and create a black hole. Moreover, the ab, you know the Hawking quanta are on average, you know, their wavelength is the size of the observable universe because it's fixed by the horizon scale. So they're both very long wavelength. And if you try and collect them, you can potentially back react. So, okay, it's a cautionary tale. I want to put the caveats here. There are more issues, but um, we're just going to kind of press ahead and, and see what we can do. So I want to explore first uh, a naive analogy, um, which looks like the following. So here I've just drawn the thermal field double black hole in, a, in ADS spacetime. So here's one ADS boundary. Here's the other one. Uh, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. That's never really been an issue. So let me know if you can't see it. Um, here's a singularity. And um, OK, if you just don't look at this, too carefully, this diagram looks like the De Sitter Penrose diagram. Okay, this is the De Sitter Penrose diagram. Each spatial slice is a sphere and you know, starts infinitely big in the past, contracts at the waist to the minimum size, and then uh, expands again to infinitely big size in the future. So here you have singularities. Here there are no singularities, at least not in the semi classical picture. It's just the uh, inflating space time. Okay. So what's, what are some of the simpler page curve computations that were done? Well, in the black hole case, uh, people took this thermal field double example and put on what's sometimes called flat space wings. Uh, by this, it's meant, well, it's literally a patch of flat space, but it's grayed out because here you don't have gravity fluctuating. Okay, In the red region, gravity is fluctuating. In the gray region, it's not. So there's some boundary conditions here. 
and um, and people, you know, measured the entropy of Hawking radiation out in this region where you don't have to worry about gravity. Okay, so you can imagine doing something similar here, the De Sitter case, uh, graying out some region in the interior of the static patch. Um, again, this is a stranger thing to do because the gravity is not really getting weak here in, 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 in the way it is near the ADS boundary. But it's something you can do and just technically compute and see what happens. It's supposed to be meant as a toy model where if you embed the sitter in something bigger. So for example, there is 2D models um, called the De Sitter Centaur where you can embed De Sitter and asymptotically ADS space time. Um, so in those, you might think that, okay, there is some region where I deform the geometry here and it becomes, let's say asymptotically ADS or asymptotically flat. There are strong constraints about how you can do that. But if you could do that in some way, uh, this, uh, the, this model that I'm gonna explore will kind of capture the behavior that, that should happen there. So um, it's, this is a more robust toy model than it looks like. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a toy model. We're gonna assume gravity is frozen here. What's this final line? So here's the microscopic description of uh, this situation. I mean, this is semi-classical space-time. You can ask, what does the holographic dual of it look like? Uh, in the case where this is ADS-2 space-time with the flat space wings, when people explore this most often, these are called the SYK dots, and they're coupled to some bath. Usually it's a two-dimensional CFT uh, living on this line, and it interacts with SYK dot in some way. And these two systems are in the thermal field double state. Okay, that's, that's the setup. But this can also be higher dimensional. If this is you know, ADS-5, this can be a CFT-4 uh, coupled to a CFT-5. Uh, also in the thermal field double. And the DeSitter case, I'm going to be thinking about higher dimensions. So the analog here, or a guess as to what the microscopic description looks like, is a similar sort of thermal field double state. Now the bath doesn't go on forever. You know, here it went on forever because it's flat space. But here, uh, you know, the, this origin, the sphere shrinks to zero size. So the space time ends. So the bath only goes for a finite region. Again, if you glued it on somehow, if there's some solution that had flat space wings out here or something like that, then this would go on forever. But that's not going to be relevant for, for what I want to say. And you can ask, in the black hole case, the gray region, uh, or at least the combination of the gray regions, can probe beyond the black hole horizon. Um, there's an island in here. You can ask, can these gray regions, either one or both, probe beyond the cosmological horizon? That'd be like a natural way to try and do an analogous computation and see if there's something like islands or um, something like the central dot line. Okay. Oh, sorry, in the case of Doshitter, the, the gravity becomes weak uh, when near this, uh, I mean, future infinity. So it is natural to put the path to the future infinity, but um, why didn't you do that? Um, uh, well, I guess, yeah. We've done that before, I guess, as yeah. you guys have as well. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't do that because I wanted an observer dependent thing. When you do the bath of future infinity, I mean, mm -hmm. it's really sort of a meta observer that you want to put up there mm -hmm. who has access to a big part of Scry Plus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here I wanted to ask if there's just some observer in their horizon, is there mm -hmm. something they can do? You know, a more physical kind of version of the question. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Like, is there something you can do in your observable patch to access an island beyond the horizon? Mm -hmm. These things at Scry Plus, they cut across many horizons and really they're more appropriate if you like exit from inflation and then look back yeah. and collect mm -hmm. the stuff from. It's yeah. also very interesting, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask this version of the question. Sure. But it's, yeah, it's, an, it's a good point that it, it is weak up there in a certain yeah. sense. <clears throat> okay. So let's, um, let's do a simple computation now uh, in, in, the, in this picture. So in this naive analogy, I said, this is the microscopic description. So the entropy I want to compute in the microscopic description is of this region here. Okay, these Xs denote the endpoints of the region. This X that sits right on this red dot uh, means that I'm also including the entropy of this system here, whatever it may be, okay? And in analogy to um, how the black hole computations are done, the way you do this is you extend this left endpoint. This left endpoint in the semi-classical picture is like right here on the interface. So it's kind of in a, it's really in a gravitating region. So you're supposed to extremize its endpoint and find some extremum for its endpoint somewhere in here, okay? Um, and the entropy you're extremizing in the semi-classical picture 
is the generalized entropy. So it's the gravitational entropy, which is localized to this endpoint. If you have just Einstein gravity, and I'm not really gonna think about any theory besides that, it's just A over 4G, where A is the area of the sphere at this uh, point. Remember the Penrose diagram hides a transverse D minus two dimensional sphere at every point, or D minus one in my conventions. Um, plus the matter entropy on this slice. So that piece is uh, you know, not localized to the endpoint. There's some matter entropy here. Okay, so you want to extremize that quantity with respect to the left endpoint. Uh, here I've told you what the answer is, and then I'll go over the argument of how you find this in, on the next slides. But I just want to jump straight to the answer because it's late. Uh, uh, what you find is an extremum that lives in the left static patch. So somehow this right region by itself, if this is correct, can uh, and I'll argue later that this is not correct, uh, should be able to reach into the left static patch which is kind of weird. This doesn't happen in the black hole case. Uh, if you do the analogous calculation in the black hole case, the endpoint lives in the right patch. And that's not surprising because the right system only encodes the right exterior by itself. You sort of need both systems to go beyond the horizon. OK. Um, OK, why am I saying that this is probably not right? Well, OK, it is weird. That's true. But there's something fundamentally wrong about a picture like this. Uh, which is you can try and test entanglement wedge nesting, which is the basic sort of logical principle that if I uh, probe more of my system, I should have access to more of it. It's, you know, it's not even like a physics assumption. It's just, I think, at the level of logic. What that means is um, as I push R2 to the right, this endpoint, you know, in this picture, I'm sort of probing more of my microscopic picture. Um, then this point R1 should move to the left. Okay, I mean, th this, this logical principle or whatever is assuming uh, something like entanglement wedge reconstruction, because, you know, the idea is that in the microscopic picture, the more you, you know, you should be able to reconstruct what's on this slice in the semi-classical picture. That's assuming entanglement wedge reconstruction. So if you assume that, then as you push R2 to the right, R1 should go to the left, but that's not what happens. As R2 moves to the right, R1 also moves to the right. So you try and act, you know, you probe more of the microscopic picture and you get less of the bulk space time, which, which doesn't make any sense. Okay. Uh, Sorry, why did this, uh, yes. Why you don't have this symmetry between uh, this G2 symmetry, which you press left and right? Um, Z2, you, you do have a Z2. If you did the same computation here, it would extend into the right static patch. Uh-huh. Okay, but sorry, what, so are you calculating entropy, right? Uh, currently, I'm just finding yeah, an, ex an, an extremum of the generalized entropy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so you are focusing on R1? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah R, R2, R2 is assumed to be fixed because it's in the non gravitating region. So I don't ah, mess sorry, with it. Okay, R2 is gravity, but the other side is. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, okay, good. So why does this happen? It happens because this point R1 that you find this extremum, it's uh, a, what I call a mini max surface. So usually when we, um, uh, okay, so classically in the Ryu Takenagi prescription, um, we find a, an extremal, well, in the covariant version, we find an extremal surface uh, in the bulk. And there's sort of an equivalent reformulation of this uh, by a maxi min prescription, um, which um, uh, has you sort of minimizing uh, on spatial slices and then maximizing over time. So it's a minimum in space and a maximum in time. This surface is the opposite, okay? It's a maximum in space and it's a minimum in time. That's sort of easy to see if you just think about its classical cousin. Its classical cousin is just the Sitter horizon. Okay, if we don't worry about quantum corrections, the de Sitter horizon, as I said, that you know the space time is something that's infinitely big in the past, shrinks to the smallest size in the middle, and then grows to infinitely big. So clearly, in time, it's a minimum. <laughs> there it is. Uh, it's it's a minimum right there, and in space, it's a maximum. It's out there. You know, it's it's uh, it's far. It surrounds us. So it's actually a mini max surface, and those surfaces are bad. Those should not be used <laughs> um, as uh, surfaces to compute entanglement entropy. Uh, there have been arguments recently that they might be, at least maximal surfaces, might be more related to complexity. 
This is slightly different than the surfaces they talk about even there. Um, but in any case, the main point I want to make is that it's different than the maxi min surfaces, which are what happened in the black hole case and accurately compute the entropy there. So I bolded this because this is sort of one of the key points I want to make. The, the Desider horizon, the black hole horizon have a lot of similarities, but a key difference is this one. Um, the use of this cosmological horizon to compute the entropy seems prohibited because the nature of this horizon is very different than the nature of the black hole horizon. In particular, it's a mini max, not a maxi min. Okay. So yeah, I just want to make sure one thing. So suppose that I take this mean max surface, uh, even in ADS, then um, this integrament with which nesting is also violated? I think so, yeah. It is I don't know to what generality you can show it, but I think you can basically prove a theorem that says these surfaces will violate entangled large nesting. I see. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, I didn't want to be completely light on details, so I want to explain how you find this surface, this, this R1. Uh, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice technique. So the first thing you want to notice is Euclidean de Sitter space is a sphere, okay? If you continue um, either the static patch metric that I wrote initially, or the global metric, if you continue to Euclidean signature, uh, you'll find that it's just an ordinary D plus one dimensional sphere. And the sphere is conformally equivalent to the plane, famously, okay? There are the stereographic projection that uh, relates the two. And there are two ways you can do a stereographic projection. There's the sort of classic way, which, I think if you open a Wikipedia article, uh, it'll be done like this. <laughs> and you project you know, from the bottom South Pole to the North Pole, these various spheres down to spheres on the plane. And then, okay, here is a you know, head-on version of what, what this plane looks like. Okay, it's just a kind of like radial, uh, radially sliced. But you can also project from the West Pole to the East Pole, okay? And that projection looks different. It looks more like an owl or something. There are these like foci and these little spheres surrounding them, and then they flip around. Okay. And um, the projection that you want to do, I'm not going to go into the exact details, but you want to use this projection to um, map the sort of time slices on the sphere so that the equator of the sphere maps to a plane in this plane, this middle one. And then remember, we're in general dimensions. So you've mapped a sphere, but there's a subsphere you can also stereographically project as well. And for the subsphere, you want to do this kind of projection. Uh, what is the point of doing these two different things? Well, what happens is that this t equals zero slice that I was talking about here, this is a sphere, and I'm computing entries on this t equals zero slice, um, that maps to a plane. And then in that plane, the subsphere maps to an annulus. So altogether, the entropy that I want to compute, which is just a, in, a region on t equals zero, maps to the entanglement entropy of an annulus in the plane, okay? There's just a conformal map that relates the two. And then there's th this nice result, which is, as um, far as I know, is due to Harada and Takayanagi, which constrains annulus entanglement entropies. You can use strong subadditivity by considering different radii and their union and their intersection and things uh, in, in a clever combination. And you get these constraints on the first derivative and second derivative. Of now, I'm just talking about the matter entropy. Okay, this is just strong subadditivity is applied to the matter entropy. Uh, you get these constraints on the entropy. R is like the ratio of the two radii of the annulus. So it says the first derivative um, is, is is positive. You know, diff the derivative grows the region, uh, grow thickens the annulus, and the second derivative is negative. I put S not here because I'm just referring to the finite piece uh, of of the entropy. So you have these constraints. Um, and we know more, we know what happens also in the two limits. Uh, as R goes to infinity, that's when the annulus gets very, very, very thick. You're kind of in the OPE limit. If you're in a pure state, you could think of the complement calculation, which is two very well separated things. And it's gonna factorize in the complement computation into the entropy of two independent spheres. So that's why there are two factors of F. F is the sphere entropy. Um, or the, again, the finite piece of the sphere entropy, because uh, S naught is just referring to the finite piece. Um, the minus sign is slightly conventional. And the factor of two is that you have two spheres in the complement of a very thick annulus. And we also know what happens as the annulus gets very thin. In that limit, you can approximate it as a parallel plate um, capacitor 
with some distance between them. And then you have a divergence. Okay, it goes like this. Kappa is some very theory dependent number, uh, but its sign is fixed. Kappa is positive, And so this entropy here is negative. Okay, so we have these nice constraints on the first and second derivatives. Um, okay, how do we use them? Let's go back to this picture that we had. So the argument is very simple. Fix, first, you fix some R2 somewhere in the gray region. Then, um, you know, R1 is extremum. So let's call R like just the coordinate as we vary this. We can push R sufficiently far to the left so that the annulus is very fat and the complement entropy factorizes meaning its entropy factorizes. So S prime matter is approximately zero, okay? You can push R far enough to do that. Now we know just by computing A over four G that uh, the derivative of the gravitational entropy is positive here. Okay, it's positive in this region and it's zero right at the bifurcate horizon because that's, a, that's you know, an extremum classically. Um, so it's positive and is decreasing towards zero. S prime matter is uh, zero and it increases due to this second derivative constraint that I was talking about earlier. So at some point, those two have to cross. One's positive and going to zero, one's zero and increasing. They're gonna cross somewhere before this bifurcate horizon. And I mean, in a very degenerate case, they can cross right at it, but generically it's gonna cross somewhere before, okay? And where they cross is the extremum because you've balanced uh, S prime matter with S prime gravity. And that's that's what it means to find an extremum. It's where the first derivative vanishes. Okay, so there's some extremum somewhere there. Um, okay, that's it. That's how you find, that's how you argue for the extremum. It, you know, you can argue for this in, in, in general dimension, but you can't find its exact location in, in general dimension because you would have to actually know what the matter entropy is and that's hard. Here, you just use these constraints to argue for its existence. And you can immediately see um, why entangling wedge nesting is violated. In particular, imagine pushing R2 all the way to the origin. Now it's no longer an annulus, it's just a sphere entropy because it got infinitely thick. Um, and which means the matter entropy, uh, S prime matter is exactly zero because the sphere entropy is just minus F. It has no dependence anymore on the spatial location. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that means that R1 is going to move to the bifurcate horizon because you want the gravitational entropy's derivative to also vanish so that the two balance. S prime matter is zero, so S prime grab has to be zero. So R1 is going to push right onto the bifurcate horizon. So you see that um, you violate entanglement wedge nesting. And you, I said you can't solve for R1 in general dimension, but in a DS2 JT gravity model, you can explicitly solve for R1 and it obeys all these things that I was saying. It lives in the left region. As you push R2 to the right, it goes to the right. Um, so you can explicitly check if you know, these arguments are like a little uh, abstract, um, you, can, you can check it in DS2, okay? All right, so this minimax surface is problematic, which is bad because you know, we wanna use the de Sitter horizon to get the entropy A over 4G. We wanna get that in the way we get the black hole entropy using Ryu Takanagi and ordinary ADS CFT. But there's one thing that I kind of ignored, which is that there's some degenerate QES I didn't talk about, which lives right at this cutoff RC. Okay, so you know when I extremize, okay, this is an extremum, it's a mini max. But in some sense, there's an extremum which lives right at R1 lives right at this cutoff. It's it's sort of the right answer, but it's also sort of useless because this RC cutoff was arbitrary. If I move the RC cutoff, the, this the QES is going to also move. It's just telling you that the region kind of wants to shrink to zero size, okay? So this RC dependence seems a little bit weird, but because what, which RC should you pick? But there's a somewhat natural RC, which is the RC that sits at the horizon. You might think that's a somewhat natural uh, cutoff to pick is to push the gray region all the way to the horizon. Uh, and motivated by that, I'm gonna kind of switch gears and think about it a little bit that way. I'm not gonna have grayed out regions anymore. So we're gonna kind of switch gears. So I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions about this part. The, the main point I wanted to emphasize is you can't use the Desider horizon naively in the same way because it's a minimax surface. So I'll just pause for a second. So well, what do you know what happens if you include the time dependence for the region uh, in the non-gravitating region? 
the time to, you mean if you shift r so, to so up? usually i mean that okay so this i mean that the, i mean the region in the path uh the end point of the region in the path can be uh time it depends on time right the location of the end point yeah yeah, yeah. and um uh, i'm wondering what well, happens I mean, well here so to answer that i have to do a two interval problem here i just did one interval uh -huh. so if i shift this up in time i can use the isometry r1's just going to go down uh -huh. right uh -huh. so in this case i know what the answer is but i think what you're asking is if i took two regions in the oh, gray yeah, yeah. patches yeah yeah then i that i didn't that, that's harder because you need to have more control over the entropies in that case oh i see i see yeah also this was sort of not working so after after this i i didn't try and compute more things because clearly oh, okay. it was uh -huh. sort of not the right idea i think mm -hmm. <laughs> which again i want to say is bad because people often want to think about embedding the sitter in ads or something else to get control over it mm. but i think this shows you that if you do that you're just not going to be able to use this bifurcate horizon to compute an entropy um it's not going to give you a sensible answer from the ads cft perspective yeah 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 i i have a, okay i i have i mean that uh, some i mean that uh, i mean okay okay yeah yeah okay i see Okay, I'm very interested in what you didn't just say. So maybe, maybe we yeah, can talk yeah, about okay. Later. So so we, we can discuss later. I mean, I have yeah. some. I mean, a note on it. But yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So let me switch gears now, uh, and think about just anchoring extremal surfaces to the horizon. So this degenerate QES I was talking about um, suggests anchoring uh, extremal surfaces to the horizon itself. Uh, this is something that has been explored uh, by various people. Um, uh, you know, I think most, mostly really the group of people at, at Berkeley. Um, there, you know, more general holographic screens and things are, are important and a big deal and absorbed in people's thinking about the problem. And so people have tried to anchor sources of the horizon, including these people. Uh, and of course, more recently, uh, Lenny Suskind also uh, tried to do it in a slightly different way. And so this brings us to the question I was asking at the beginning of the talk, which side of the horizon is encoded? You know, if you anchor surfaces to the horizon, you're sort of saying that there's some microscopic theory that lives there. But you can ask, well, which side is it encoding? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we can address that from the point of view of holographic screens, but I, I won't really do that in, unless people want to ask me during the Q&A. But here, I'd just like to uh, draw an analogy because I was at least naively for a while confused how you can have this microscopic theory with space time to both sides. But that, that was just me being silly, that you, one shouldn't be confused about that. Because in ADS-CFT, we have examples <clears throat> where you can uh, understand that. So if we go back to our ADS space time with flat space wings, um, as I wrote before, we have a thermal field double picture of what the microscopic description is. And then we have also a doubly holographic picture. If the d-dimensional CFT on the space time is holographic, then there's a picture where you have a d plus one dimensional ADS space time, um, and this is the this red thing is the is the sometimes called the Planck brain or Karch Randall brain or Randall Sundrum brain has a lot of names, uh, but has a d dimensional ADS on it, which is just this d dimensional ADS here, and this flat space region is this flat space region here. I haven't drawn the thermal field double, which would like you can draw it somewhere down here, but whatever. I just drew one half. You can modify this picture in a simple way um where you make this bath region finite and then put another uh d-dimensional uh, ads region on the other side of it and this penrose diagram is periodically identified as you go around okay so now um you have two uh quantum systems the blue one that lives at this cutoff and the red one that lives at this cutoff and it's thermal field double and the reservoir bath that they interact with and they're all together in a thermal field double state. In the Planck brain picture, it looks like this. You have two Planck brains now cutting it off and still a d plus one dimensional ADS bulk. Uh, finally, you can take a limit where you shrink this gray region to zero size and these blue and red things end up right on top of each other. So they, well, this is meant to be purple but it looks more like pink. Anyway, uh, these two systems sit right on top of each other. There's no bath anymore and they're in a thermal field double state. Okay, and the Planck brain picture looks like this. I guess, sorry, I should have put uh, more cite citations here. There's several people in the audience who've, who've studied the, this picture and I think um, coined it wedge holography. Um, but uh, it's a simple picture where you can see there's a microscopic theory that lives 
right here at this interface, and it encodes both sides. Well, at least this and its buddy encode both sides of the space-time. So there isn't really an issue, even in the ADS-CFT context, of having space-time to both sides of the microscopic theory. Okay, And the prescription in this case is to find an extremal surface on both sides of the ADS boundary. If you pick a region on the ADS boundary, you extremize to the left and you extremize to the right. Okay, So motivated by uh, that prescription, and again, uh, apologies, I didn't put a, put a citation for it. Um, uh, like I said, it was, I think it was done by uh, several people in the audience. Um, motivated by that prescription, we're going to propose the same prescription in the De Sitter context. Okay, so what does that look like? Here's the Penrose diagram of De Sitter space again. Let's say you take some global slice, this gray slice here. Uh, what does that slice look like? Well, it's just a sphere. Okay, and the horizons are like here. There's the H left, I right is the left horizon, H right is like the right horizon. Um, this exterior region is like the inflating region here. And here are the interiors of the two static patches. Okay. Um, and I, I find it somewhat helpful to kind of imagine breaking apart this sphere. Because you're doing a two sided extremization, it's sort of easy to like think about them independently. Like you draw a region here, you find a, you know, Ryu Takanagi surface in here, you do the same thing here, you know, kind of do it step by step. Um, but anyway, it's just, it's just a simplification, this picture. Um, so let's do some simple computations. You know, the microscopic theory, again, an analogy to what I was saying before, should live on the union of the two horizons. It lives on H left union H right. Okay, that's the proposal. And the simplest computation you can do is the entropy of the union. Okay, that gives you zero because if you extremize to the left, when you've taken the entire horizon, it's allowed to shrink to zero size. Um, and then for H right, when you extremize to the right, it's allowed to shrink to zero size. And when you extremize in between, the circles are allowed to kind of coalesce and annihilate. So really the Ryu Takanagi surface is just the trivial surface um, and the entanglement wedge is everything, which had better be true. If the full microscopic theory is H left union H right, you'd better encode the entire space time. Okay, so that's just a simple thing to check. Um, you can consider just one horizon now. Let's just say you considered uh, the left horizon. Now, when you extremize to the left, you're still allowed to shrink to zero size. Okay, so that extremization doesn't give you any area. But now when you extremize to the right, you have this topological obstruction, this right horizon. So it can't, even though it wants to, it can't shrink in this direction. This is because of how I set up what the encoding should be like. Um, it can't shrink and the smallest it can be is to sit right on this horizon itself. Okay, and then that just gives you A over 4G with the entanglement wedge being the interior. This is also what we would want. We want a horizon to, well, it's natural to think that a horizon should encode the interior. And okay, this is one way to see that that's what it does. And it doesn't encode the exterior unless it also knows about its buddy living at H right. Okay, this is a little bit more like the thermal field double kind of picture. And in this way of thinking about it, you can actually think about the horizon as a maximum surface. You can sort of set up a covariant maximum prescription where this thing is um, uh, uh, an ordinary maximum. Okay, but that's kind of boring. That's like the simplest things you can check. Uh, let's do a slightly less boring thing to check, which is Schwarzschild de Sitter. Okay, here's the metric for Schwarzschild de Sitter. Um, looks like a black hole with the de Sitter factors, it's simple. And here's the Penrose diagram. These just denote that it's periodically identified. So the topology is different now of the space time. Okay, here's the black hole region. Here's the de Sitter region. In this case, we can repeat the computations. Let's say we compute the entropy of just the left horizon. Then it looks similar. For the right extremization, when we extremize to the right, we again just land here because of this topological obstruction. We get the area of the cosmological horizon over 4G. When we extremize to the left, um, the extreme, the smallest point is here, the you know, kind of inside the wormhole of the black hole. Okay, or you know, if you're at time t equals zero, for example, the bifurcate horizon of the black hole. So you get the area of the black hole over 4G. Okay, and the entanglement wedge is a region between the black hole and the cosmological horizon, which again is, is, uh, is reasonable. If you just have, if you imagine this was like a black hole in ADS, um, then the right boundary should only know about like the right exterior. 
So now, or the left boundary should only know about the left exterior. So now the left horizon only knows about the left exterior. It doesn't actually go inside the black hole because this point here is the bifurcate horizon of the black hole. Okay. And if you consider the union of the two, H left union, H right, you again find that the entropy is zero. And here it's important that, you know, when I kind of broke this sphere up into pieces and said you do these extremizations independently, uh, really the actual problem should be just a total extremization over all the surfaces. Meaning if you did the extremization separately on the left and the right in this picture, then the left extremization would give you this surface when you did it for this region. And the right extremization here would again give you this surface. You would sort of forget that actually they're connected. And when I do a joint extremization, I'm allowed to bring them through each other and annihilate them and have a trivial surface. So when you actually do this extremization on H left union H right, you always need to remember that you can't actually always extremize independently. It's really a single extremization. You find the global minimum over all possible uh, surfaces. And in this case, the global minimum is clearly the trivial one. Okay. So those are still a little bit trivial. One thing you can try and do, although it's a little bold because it's not clear that it makes sense, is to consider subregions on a horizon. It's unclear that looking at subregions on a horizon is a reasonable thing to do. It's kind of like, it's a harder version of trying to chop up the internal space in ADS CFT because, um, well, A, it's not clear that there's any locality to this theory I'm talking about that lives on the horizon. And B, the interior of it is sub, the sitter scales, which is like sub ADS scales, because it's a single horizon um, in there. So it's a tricky thing to do, but you can still just try it and then see what happens. And something interesting happens, which is that here's the region that I pick, and I have to extremize to the left and to the right. And what you'll find is that it just wants to sit on the region itself, because the area is going to grow if it tries to go out in this direction. And similarly for this region here, the area is going to grow if it tries to go out into this region. So it's going to the surface is the Jenner one that sits right there. And the entanglement wedge is basically nothing. It doesn't encode anything, OK? Um, and you get a volume law growth, because it just grows with the size of the region itself with a factor of two. Uh, that indicates non-locality, usually volume law growth. It either indicates you're in a thermal state or it indicates non-locality in the if you're in the vacuum. And to sitter, any state you pick is going to have this volume law, so it seems more indicative of non-locality. And the central dogma is threatened. If this curve continued, uh, it would exceed area over 4G Newton. So the quantum system that I'm claiming lives on this horizon, H left, would have more degrees of freedom than A over 4G, okay? But a transition happens. There it is, and it saves you. Right when you hit the halfway point, when you're about to threaten the central dogma of Mahound, there's an island-like transition. This surface now for the left extremization is allowed to flip around. It's allowed to flip around because it doesn't have a topological obstruction here and take up the complement of the region you were considering. And now this uh, region, union this region, has total uh, area just out of the horizon. Um, and the entanglement wedge is now the entire interior. That's why I call it island-like because you go from encoding none, nothing inside the horizon to once you have a order but one fraction of the system to encoding almost, every, well, in this case, everything inside the horizon. So it's a bit island-like. Uh, sorry, can I ask an elementary question? Why yeah, absolutely. Red, red, uh, I mean, area grows linearly unbounded, three. So I thought that it may be bounded by this a total size of Dojita horizon. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I stopped it here. Yeah, it's, it doesn't go forever. So it ends here. Uh -huh. This is actually two times the area. And it's just because ah. in my prescription, there's you just have this factor of two. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, this was unclear. It looked like it grew forever, but yeah. Okay, I'm almost done with the examples. There's one other interesting example you can do when you consider subregions on a horizon, which is to consider subregions on both horizons. Okay. And then you have four possible cells. I mean, there are more, but there are only four that are going to be dominant. Uh, one is you consider the regions themselves that you were computing the entropy of. Uh, another, which is going to be more dominant when the regions are large, is to consider the complements. Okay. Now you 
So in this picture, I'm computing the entropy of the black regions on the horizons. Now you are allowed to flip these external surfaces uh, because, well, because you have a similar surface on this side. So there's no, there's no topological obstruction. They're both allowed to flip down. Um, and in this case, the entanglement wedge would be everything and here it would be nothing. Uh, but unsurprisingly, there are uh, two additional saddles, which are interesting. They're like the hartmann maldacena saddles in the black hole context, which is surfaces that kind of cut across the uh, inflating region. Okay, those are also allowed now when you have regions on both horizons. Okay, um, and there are two here because in the interior extremization, you know, it can sit either on the cut of the horizon or its complement. Both are uh, both are allowed. Um, in the middle, it's still just kind of cutting across. Okay. So what does this look like in the in the Penrose diagram? Well, it's kind of simple. At early times, you can sort of see just from this picture, it's favorable to have this connected saddle that cuts across the horizon. So this is a picture for three-dimensional de Sitter, as was the earlier one. It's favorable to cut across because this distance is very short. Um, but as you go up in global time, that distance is kind of getting larger, OK? Um, in DS3, it's actually bounded. I was a bit surprised by this. The distance between these two horizons is bounded by 2 pi um, because you know, while the distance is getting larger, the surface is also getting more null. So there's like a competing effect, which makes the distance small. And these geodesics are actually um, just pieces of the degenerate family of geodesics that connects the origin of the static patch here uh, to the origin here. So, you know, if you remember like on a sphere, they're all the great circles, uh, you know, two antipodal points are related by a degenerate infinite family of great circles. That's just the funny thing about antipodal points on the sphere. There's a similar statement for de Sitter. If you're at t equals zero and you pick antipodal points, which these two static patch origins and the antipodal point are, then there's an infinite number of planes you could intersect with the de Sitter hyperboloid, which give you uh, geodesics, which connect those two points. And those geodesics, they you know, run from here to here, and then they become kind of more and more null as you go up. And this is just a piece of those geodesics. And they stop existing past this halfway point. Halfway meaning halfway from like sigma equals zero in global time to sigma equals pi over two. At sigma equals pi over four, these surfaces stop existing. There's just no connected surface. Um, and the transition between the connected and disconnected surface always happens before that. Okay. Uh, in three dimensions, the area of this again is finite. So you need to actually calculate and check that that's true. Uh, in higher dimensions, the area of the analogous surface diverges actually once you hit this null point. Um, so it's definitely going to transition before that. Uh, I think that's a good check because usually when a surface starts stops dominating because it disappears, it's a little confusing. It's always better for there to be some transition and dominance before some surface disappears into the complex plane or something. But anyway, this is like a, a natural analog of the hartmann maldacena type transition. Okay. I think I'm just going to make some uh, comments and summarize. But before I do that, are there, well, maybe since there's a, there'll be a short question period, I'll just make the comments and summarize, and then people can ask. Okay, first comment is that entanglement wedge nesting is satisfied in all these examples that I've looked at. And I think that's basically guaranteed by the fact that horizons are holographic screens. It's a little funny because they're not naively holographic screens for the inflating region to the future. So in that sense, they shouldn't necessarily be guaranteed to satisfy time wise nesting, but uh, probably still guaranteed by that, by the fact that they are uh, holographic screens at least for some regions. Um, an important point is because I did this two-sided extremization, you have a well-defined entanglement wedge. And this implies a natural quantum extremal surface extension to the formulas I was looking at. In the second part of this talk, I was just doing classical entropies and just the gravitational entropy. I didn't talk about quantum corrections, but you have entanglement wedges, so there's a natural guess that you add in the matter entropy of the entanglement wedge for a QES extension. One weird point is that a single horizon um, can actually encode the exterior in this. It may be able to encode the exterior if you allow solutions which have different horizon sizes. Usually the solutions we consider like the sitter Schwarzschild or something like that, they have a Z2 type symmetry, which shrinks both horizons equally. But you can, you can mess with that. You can write down other solutions uh, which have horizons of different sizes. Then if you consider the entropy of the bigger horizon, 
Well, it's going to want to grow and shrink to the smaller one uh, and take up that horizon. And then the entangle wedge would be the full exterior. Okay, if this is allowed in the fundamental theory, uh, then it must be the case that the theories are interacting. Okay, that's not too surprising because it's also true that if you try and do this shock wave type thing that you do in the black hole context, then instead of the wormhole getting longer and separating the two, the Penrose diagram grows taller. There's a nice paper by Myers and Rolf and LeBlanc called Tall Tales in Desitter Space, which explores the fact that this Penrose diagram gets taller. And then the two static patches can now communicate with one another. And of course, there's the bifurcate horizon point where they kind of meet. So it's natural that they at least interacted there uh, before going on their separate ways. So it's not too crazy that they're interacting. You're still saved a little bit because the encoding should at least be complex. You know, to move the surface from the big horizon to the small horizon, there's a, what's called the Python's lunch nowadays in the middle. Um, so the encoding of the exterior region is, 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 is complex from only having access to one of them. Uh, I should comment, you know, there's a similar prescription by, by Lenny uh, Susskind, and his extremization is only in the region between the cosmological horizons. So I did this two-sided thing. He really only did one-sided things. And you get all the same answers if you only ever consider a full horizon or a union of horizons, uh, which that may be the only sensible thing to do. Uh, but if you chop up a horizon, um, uh, then, then the two prescriptions give you different answers. Um, so it's interesting to explore if you know one or the other can be ruled out. OK, so just to summarize, uh, the cosmological horizon is very different than the black hole horizon in the sense mini max versus maxi min. So it doesn't naively work as a quantum extremal surface. Uh, you can kind of evade that by anchoring to the horizon itself. That sort of lets you, in a somewhat trivial way, use the horizon itself as a, as a maxi min surface. And then you don't violate entanglement wedge uh, nesting. And you get some interesting answers, especially in the case where you chop up a horizon. The fact that you're about to violate the central dogma, and then you have this transition I find pretty compelling. I would like to understand it better. Um, there are some slight puzzles associated with that uh, transition, actually. Um, and you know, we'd like to make it a little bit sharper. The first part of this talk was kind of sharp. The second part was pretty speculative, of course. And a natural thing to say is like, do we even know how to anchor to a black hole event horizon before we even get to consider? So my, my one comment about that is A, yeah, it would be great to explore. And maybe in ADS-CFT, one could do that and try and understand how you anchor surfaces to the black hole event horizon. Um, but B, even if you can't, it's not clear that you can't do it in the de context. As I said, these horizons are very different in nature. Um, so it could be that something that works for the de horizon doesn't necessarily work for the ADS horizon. As we know, the rules for de and ADS seem very different. <laughs> so we shouldn't always uh, even though I was motivated by ADS, we shouldn't always try and uh, blindly say what goes in ADS is what goes in DS. Um, so that's an interesting thing to explore is in the black hole case. And finally, more general cosmologies. In more general cosmologies, you don't, the, the global decider is very special in that this encoding could be on this pair of horizons. More generally, there's no reason that that should happen. If you have a big bang, like our universe, you have a big bang, and then you ask them to, to decider. Um, there isn't a sensible way to say these two horizons encode everything. In fact, you know, every observer's horizon probably just encodes their interior. There doesn't seem to be a, a more general encoding than that. So it'd be nice to understand that better and what's understand what's so special about the desitter and desitter like cases. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, so do you have any comments from the perspective of bulk reconstruction? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? What kind of comments are you curious uh, about? So here, uh, you're considering the uh, entanglement, which uh, is in that uh, two-sided uh, uh, cosmological horizon case. And yeah. so uh, so in principle, if you believe in region duality, then uh, you should be able to uh, reconstruct uh, the bulk operator inside the entanglement wedge. But, yeah. Uh, is there any attempts uh, or do you have any comments for uh, uh, explicit procedure to reconstruct such bulk operators? Uh, 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, you know, in the ADS CFT context, it's always a little bit simpler to think, well, I have a dual CFT, it's just kind of separate from the ADS space time, one or the other exists, and I can manipulate things here and then reconstruct things in the bulk. Here it's a lot harder because it's all kind of tangled up together. It's not clear that you can really think about, you know, if you could really think about a separate quantum system, which is this theory on the pair of horizons that I'm talking about, which just lives in some auxiliary universe and has some observer who can manipulate it, then you can say the same things that that observer can then manipulate this quantum system and do what it wants to this de space time. But what we would really want is something more like uh, the page curve in the black hole context. Then the holographic dual, the radiation, is a part of the system itself. And an observer who's in that system, we expect can do things to it and then manipulate the interior. I suspect your question is more along those lines. That uh, is unclear because if this thing is on the horizons, who's going to go to those? You know, if you move, your horizon moves. So you can't really even go there to like manipulate that system. It, it's sort of different. It's more like the ordinary ADS CFT context. Mm -hmm. And there, yeah, like I said, you would just really want to abstractly think about a quantum system defining the de Sitter space. And then entanglement wedge reconstruction should be the same. You can imagine manipulating that quantum system. And in this gravitational description, things would happen. Let's see. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So yeah, I have a question on, I mean, the when, I mean, that the effect of this back reaction is taken into account, as you said, I mean, that in the case of Toshitro space, the parallel diameter gets taller and taller and the yeah. holographic screen uh, eventually intersects or something. Um, do you think that um, even in that case, I mean, is this, is a prescription applicable because, because these two holographic screens intersect? So what do you mean? The holographic screens without even it getting taller already intersect, at least the screens that I'm talking about. So what intersection are you referring to? Um, yeah, okay. So, so this is very close to the, the cosmological horizons, right? Sorry, I don't know which Penrose diagram to go through. They all have crap oh, on. No, yeah. Okay, let's go to this one. Yeah. So and here there's an intersection. Yeah. Right, yeah. but but I mean, look, this left the holographic screen and the right screen. Holographic screen doesn't. I mean that. Oh, so you're saying if you, if you if you slightly regulate this, then they won't intersect. But of course, if they get taller, even the regulated thing will intersect. That's what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So what was the what was the question? So 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 in that case, I mean, uh, do do you think that the similar prescription applies? I mean, I think so. I think mm -hmm. there. I think there. What you're explicitly doing when you mm -hmm. consider these tall tail mm -hmm. type geometries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is really an interaction between the two systems. Like mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know, they're interacting, but mm -hmm. in the states I'm considering, they're mm -hmm. sort of trivial. They're like a double copy of something on the same two sides. There isn't really some dynamical interaction happening. But to grow mm -hmm. this taller, you really need to send in some radiation from one of the sides or do something like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to grow it taller. Mm -hmm. And then there's some explicit interaction between them. Mm. Um, but there shouldn't really be any issue with still doing the encoding. I mean, the one issue you yes. can potentially have mm. is some of these states that you might consider, which grow the Penrose diagram taller, mm -hmm. if you kind of went to the past, would have a singularity in the past. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. situations where you have a past singularity are pretty different, actually. Um, you know, the reason, so I didn't say this in the talk, but I'll say it mm -hmm. now. If you do holographic screens, mm -hmm. then this upper triangle region is not encoded on this horizon or that horizon. The area is just not big enough. If you just do the, well, however you like to do it, the Busso wedges and try and project information to screens or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, it's not gonna be encoded here. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, is a little bit radical from that point of view, mm -hmm. but the reason why it's okay is because of this entire Penrose diagram. It's true if you project information and use holographic screens, this horizon that goes from top left to bottom right mm -hmm. encodes every, can encode everything in here in this triangle. Mm -hmm. And this horizon, which goes from top right to bottom left, mm -hmm. can encode everything in this triangle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, the union of those two things mm -hmm. gives you a complete Cauchy slice. And this is just in the future of that slice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, these two horizons know about what's in here if it came from what was down here. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you have a singularity with no bifurcate horizon, it's just, a, again, Big Bang and an asymptote to the sitter, mm -hmm. you don't have that argument anymore. And there isn't a natural way you could even pick a pair of horizons or one horizon and say that it encodes the exterior. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the things that uh, I would I like to understand better. I and I, th I think they just don't. I think this is just a very special case. Because you have this bottleneck at t equals zero where you have to shove all this stuff through, mm -hmm. it's a bit like a time like version of you know Python's lunch style bottlenecks. Because you got to shove all this stuff through this bottleneck, there isn't actually as much stuff up here as you might think. I think that's mm -hmm. one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that these horizons do have a chance of encoding it. But if you have a singularity and no bottleneck, then you seemingly can have arbitrarily uh, as, as much information as you want. Mm -hmm. So that thank case you. is pretty different. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, if not, let's thank Edgar for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It was a lot of fun.